Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. NVIDIA control panel update for 2024 coming up on today's episode of 2020 Flight Simmers. Welcome back everyone. I first want to apologize for my voice. I'm still getting over the flu, so I hope you can deal with the audio. In today's video, I will be going over all of the NVIDIA control panel settings, as well as some of the new settings that have been added in some recent updates. At the end of this video, I have a bonus application I will be going over that can help manage your RAM and memory usage during your gameplay. Now this application will help everyone, but especially those who are on a limited amount of RAM, like 16 gigabytes. So make sure to stay tuned till the end for that. If you have any questions along the way today, post them down below in the comments section and I'll get right back with you. If you enjoy today's content, make sure to hit that subscribe, tick on that little bell, and smash that thumbs up button. It is greatly appreciated. All right, so now let's dive into the NVIDIA control panel. If you would like all of my other graphic and performance settings for Microsoft Flight Simulator, as well as some other tweaks that can help get you a little bit more FPS, check out the description. I have full guides for PC and VR. So once you have the NVIDIA control panel open, on the left hand side, these are all of the menus that we can go through. We're going to start at the very top in the 3D settings under adjust image settings with preview. The first thing that we need to do here is to check use the advanced 3D image settings and then you want to hit the apply. Now that we have done that, we can move into the manage 3D settings over on the left hand side. In the manage 3D settings, before we start making any adjustments here, we need to make sure that everything is set to our default values in the control panel. To do that, we're going to hit the restore button and then you want to hit the apply button down at the very bottom. You will notice at the top we have two different tabs, a global settings as well as a program settings tab. This will allow us to control specific settings for individualized programs, which I highly recommend you do for Microsoft Flight Simulator. More on that in just a moment. For now, let's go back to our global settings tab. In the global settings tab, there's only one thing that we're going to be changing here. We're going to scroll all the way down to our shader cache size, and you want to make sure that you set this to either 10 gigabyte, or if you have a huge SSD, set this to unlimited. This is also the suggested file size given by NVIDIA. Now, one other setting that I do want to touch on in the global settings is the DSR factors. I know some people have started using this on your system and some people may not understand what this is actually for. DSR factors will not give you any added performance per se. DSR factors, what this will allow us to do is to upscale our image to a higher resolution inside the simulator. They have now implemented a DL scaling, which can give you the same quality, but it is twice as efficient. I've had some people question me on whether they should use this or not. Here's my opinion on this particular setting. Yes, it can give you some awesome clarity inside of the simulator, but this may and may not work out for some people, and let me explain why. For this demonstration, I will be using Tech Power Up's GPU-Z over here on the right-hand side. This is a great application to help you Try to figure out if using DSR factors is going to be a viable option on your system. Now keep in mind that DSR factors will not affect VR. This is only for your monitor. So who will this setting be good for? If you are someone that has a much higher end GPU than your CPU, then this may be a viable option for you to help add some more load to your GPU and kind of balance things out inside of the simulator. You'll notice on the Tech Power Up GPU Z application on the right hand side, there's an information tab called GPU Load. 
Now when you spawn into Microsoft Flight Simulator, open up the GPU-Z application and take a look at the load that is placed on your GPU. Now if your GPU is way overpowered for your CPU, you will notice that your GPU load may only be about 30%. When I spawn into Microsoft Flight Simulator, my GPU load is actually near 80%. So that tells me that both my CPU and GPU are playing very nice together and I don't have much overhead on my GPU load. Now, if you only have a 30% load on your GPU, then you have a much higher overhead so that you can use the DLDSR factors. All you would need to do is to check the box, click OK, and then you'll probably hit apply down at the bottom. You will also have a DSR smoothness to set and you can mess with this anywhere between 30 and 60 percent. Now what that means is it's going to smooth out the edges on your images so that they're not too sharp. After you have this selected you must also go in the change resolution section of the NVIDIA control panel and select your dynamic super resolution here and then hit apply. And then once you spawn into the sim, in your graphics menu under the resolution tab, you will see your new resolution settings available. So I hope that can give you a little bit of an explanation on what DSR factors are going to do and who may be the right person to use this on your system. So now with that out of the way, I no longer need the GPU-Z application. I'll get rid of that. And now what we're going to do is move over to the program settings tab at the very top. In the program settings, you want to make sure that you select Microsoft Flight Simulator from the drop down. If Microsoft Flight Simulator is not in your drop down menu, then all we need to do is to add that. To do that, we're going to go down and check the box to show only programs found on your PC, and then you hit the add button. When you do that, this will bring up all of the recently used applications. So an easy way to find Microsoft Flight Simulator is simply to open Microsoft Flight Simulator, let it run, and then close the application, and then Microsoft Flight Simulator will show up in your recently used applications. You will then select it, hit Add Selected Program at the bottom, and then it will populate here in your dropdown. So now that we have added Microsoft Flight Simulator to our program settings, we can now run through all the various settings at the bottom to change. The first setting is Image Scaling, and this is the NVIDIA Image Scaling tool. Honestly, I don't really recommend to use this anymore, but if you are on a lower end system, this might be a viable option to get some more FPS. Basically what this is going to do is scale down the image on your screen, add a little bit of sharpening, and then upscale it to fit or stretch it to fit your monitor. Like I said, it really doesn't work very well in Microsoft Flight Simulator. The next option down is anisotropic filtering. I have this set to 16 times in the NVIDIA control panel. The reason for this is in Microsoft Flight Simulator, I know we have the option in there but it does not give us the very clear image that the driver-based anisotropic filtering does in the NVIDIA control panel. So if you have this set to 16x in your control panel, make sure that you turn it off inside of the sim. The next option down is anti-aliasing gamma correction. We have this set to on. Basically, this is going to help with some color correction in the sim and it will prevent things from looking too washed out. This is on by default, but again, I would just recommend to keep that on. The next option down is anti-aliasing mode. I have this set to application controlled, meaning we're gonna control our anti-aliasing inside of the sim. Below that, anti-aliasing transparency, we have that set to off. Next one down is background application max frame rate. We're gonna keep this off. What this will do is if you click off of the main application, you can set a FPS that that application will run in the background. So you really just want to keep this off. 
Below that, we have CUDA GPUs. You want to make sure that you select your GPU and then hit OK. The next option that we have is CUDA System Fallback Policy. This is a new option that NVIDIA has just invoked recently in some updates for their driver. Now, let me explain what this is actually used for and why they implemented this in the first place. I know everybody is quite familiar with the dreaded application error for your memory. Oh no! Well, that is the sole reason why NVIDIA implemented the system fallback policy. What the system fallback policy will do, and this is either on driver default or system fallback, these are both the same. What this will do is when your GPU runs out of VRAM, it will then fall back or revert to your system RAM. Now you might say, well, hey, that's a great idea for them to do that, but this will now inject some inherent problems. So let me explain. The VRAM that is on your GPU is most likely DDR6 memory. And the RAM that is on your PC is either DDR4 or DDR5, which is significantly slower than DDR6 RAM. So now before I go into which one of these you should choose for your system, let me explain in NVIDIA's terms what this is actually going to sacrifice on your system and why. Links for this webpage will be down below in the description if you would like to take a look at this for yourself. So in driver version 536, they have implemented a new method to allow an application to use shared memory in cases that you've exhausted all of your GPU memory. This enabled applications which previously crashed when running out of GPU memory to continue to run albeit at lower speeds. Stable diffusion happens to require close to six gigabytes of GPU memory. This can cause the above mechanism, the system fallback option, to be invoked for people with six gigabytes of VRAM on your GPU, reducing the application speed. In driver 546 and above, they've added a setting to disable the shared memory fallback, which should allow performance to be stable at the risk of a crash if you run out of GPU memory. So now you might say, well, fine, I'll just prefer no system fallback. Problem arises if you run out of VRAM on your GPU, you could now induce a crash or some severe stutters. So who should use driver default or prefer system fallback? And who should use no system fallback? Anybody that has, I would say, 12 gigabytes and higher of VRAM, you will probably be a great candidate for choosing no system fallback. Now, like I said, you really want to make sure that you monitor this inside of Microsoft Flight Simulator using the FPS tool. At the very bottom, it will tell you how much VRAM you have available and how much VRAM is being used. So for those of you who are running under 10 gigabytes of VRAM, it is most likely going to be a great idea for you, for you to use driver default or prefer system fallback. I hope that makes some sense. And if you have any questions about that, please let me know down below in the comments. Next down on the list is low latency mode, and I have this set to off. Now with the recent implementation of NVIDIA's Reflex technology, we no longer need to have a driver-based low latency mode inside of the NVIDIA control panel, at least for Microsoft Flight Simulator. With the Reflex technology inside of Microsoft Flight Simulator, you can either turn that to on or on and boost. The difference when you turn Reflex on is it will just run in low latency mode. When you turn on and boost, it will override your power management mode inside of the NVIDIA control panel running at maximum performance. Oh, and also, by the way, if you are a VR user, 
I do not recommend to use the reflex low latency mode, but if you are on monitor, I would recommend turning on reflex low latency mode inside of Microsoft Flight Simulator. The next option down is OpenGL GDI compatibility. I have this set for performance. Below that is OpenGL rendering GPU. I just leave this on auto select or you can select your GPU. Power management mode, I have mine set to prefer maximum performance. Now, some people have issues with running prefer maximum performance and seem to have overheating issues with their GPU. If you are running into those issues, just set this up for normal. This way your GPU won't throttle if it does get too hot. Below that we have preferred refresh rate. I keep this on application controlled. Texture filtering, anisotropic sample optimization. I have this set to off. Now if you are on a lower end PC and need a little bit more FPS, you could always come in here and turn this on. Now what this can do is it could induce some shimmers on your images. So if you are noticing shimmering textures or anything like that, turning this off will help reduce that. Below this is texture filtering negative LOD bias, and I have this set to clamp. The reason why we set this to clamp is it will help prevent aliasing on static objects when you are moving past them. Below that is texture filtering quality. I have this set to high performance. Honestly, I really don't notice much of a difference when I switch between any of the settings here, but just keep in mind that when you do switch between these settings, it can and will change some of your texture filtering options. Below that is texture filtering trilinear optimization. I have this set to on. Threaded optimization, you can either set this to auto or on. Below that is triple buffering. I have this set to off. And down below that is vertical sync. Now vertical sync can be used either in the NVIDIA control panel or can be used inside of the sim. So if you go through all of the settings that we're gonna go through here today, as well as your resolution and refresh rate, and you still have tearing inside of Microsoft Flight Simulator, then you want to mess around with vertical sync. I would recommend using vertical sync in Microsoft Flight Simulator first, so you would want to make sure that you use application settings to be able to do that. Now, if you find that you still have tearing, even when you're using the vertical sync in Microsoft Flight Simulator, then you can come into the NVIDIA control panel and try out the fast option here at the bottom. Now that will hopefully eliminate any of the tearing if you still had some, but if it doesn't, I'm really not sure what else to try. Below this, we have virtual reality pre-rendered frames, and I have this set to one. Generally, between one or two frames seems pretty good. If you have any more than that, this could induce some latency in VR, but this is all gonna be personal preference, so I would suggest to try out different settings here. Let me know what you're using down below in the comments. At the very bottom, we have Vulkan OpenGL present method, and I have this set to auto. All right, so now that we're finished here, let's move down to the next menu. Now, there's really nothing in the configure sound and physics other than you wanna make sure that auto select is selected for your physics settings, but I really don't think uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator uses this, so it really doesn't matter. Below that, we have change resolution in the display section. Here's where we're gonna be able to set up our native resolution for your monitor, as well as your refresh rate. And this is really gonna be important to helping reduce screen tearing. But in any case, let me go ahead and show you how to set up your native resolution and refresh rate. So you'll notice under the resolution section under PC, you will see in parentheses native. This is gonna be my native resolution for my monitor. That's what you wanna select for your monitor, the native resolution. Over on the right hand side is a refresh rate. 
Uh, yes, we have a bunch of different refresh rates that I can choose on my monitor, but you want to choose the native refresh rate. To get your native refresh rate, just click off of the current resolution and then re-click your native resolution. You will see over here on the right hand side that your refresh rate will automatically select your native refresh rate. Once you have done that, we can move down to the bottom. These are going to be some of the color settings that we can adjust. By default, you should be up here. Go ahead and use the NVIDIA color settings, and then you want to make sure that you're using full dynamic range. And if you have options for output color depth, you could also up this as well. The desktop color depth, you want to make sure you have the highest available. And then we're going to just keep RGB format down below and then make sure you hit apply to apply all of the settings. All right, so now that we're done here, let's move down to the adjust desktop color settings. Now, if you're someone like me that has de-bloated your NVIDIA driver and has completely removed all the unnecessary things like GeForce Experience, I will also post a link down below in the description for that video. You will also know that we don't have as many options for adjusting some of the colors on your screen anymore. In this menu is where we can do that, and the only setting that I like to change here is the digital vibrance, and I usually like to bump this up to around 60 or so, and this will just help the colors pop just a little bit more on your screen. Once you're done here, make sure you hit the apply button at the very bottom. All right, so I think that's going to take care of the NVIDIA control panel settings. If you have any questions about this, please let me know down below in the comments. And now for the bonus portion of today's video, the Intelligent Standby List Cleaner. This application is going to be very helpful for Microsoft Flight Simulator or any games for that matter. This is going to perform two major tasks for us. One, it's going to help purge any built up excessive memory that might be in our system. Now, this is going to be particularly important for those long haul flights that we start seeing an excessive amount of memory build up. This will also be particularly important for those of you who are running lower RAM, like 16 gigabytes. This will help keep some overhead for you so you don't run into any stutters or crashes. The other thing that this will allow us to do is to set a timer resolution on our system. By adjusting a custom timer resolution, we can reduce the amount of latency that we have on our system. So now that you understand what this is gonna do, let me show you where to get it. Links for this page will be down below in the description. Once you are here, you wanna go down to download ISLC here and give that a left click. This will download the zip file for us in your download section or wherever you have your downloads going to. Once you have this downloaded on your system, you want to double click on the application and choose a location to extract this. I prefer my desktop and when you choose that, it will place a folder directly on your desktop for the ISLC application. Once the folder is on your desktop, you can double click to get into it, and then we can double click on the application to open the ISLC cleaner. Now for starters, you wanna come down to the lower left-hand corner, and we're gonna tick the Start ISLC Minimized and Auto Start Monitoring. We also wanna tick the Launch ISLC on User Logon, and this way it will open the application as well as start the application running. Before we can actually turn the application on or start the application, we need to set up some parameters inside of this first. So down in the lower left hand corner for the list size, you wanna make sure that you have the first number here set to 1024. In the box below this one, you wanna enter whatever half of your RAM is in your system. Now, keep in mind, this is done in megabytes and not gigabytes. Let's turn our attention to the right-hand side of the ISLC, and this is where we can adjust our current timer resolution. At the very top, you'll see that right now we are running at one millisecond. On older systems, this can go up to 15 milliseconds. 
Now the optimal timer resolution is going to be 0.5 milliseconds. So we can set a wanted timer resolution down here below in this box. Now you may have a little bit of a problem trying to enter this. So let me show you how we're going to enter 0.5 milliseconds. You do not want to delete everything here. Just go ahead and delete the one and then move your cursor over to the first zero, delete, and then enter five. Now your wanted timer resolution should say 0 0.500. Now that you have that set, we need to enable the custom timer resolution below. So we're going to tick on the first box and that'll enable the timer resolution on our system. Now if you are using Windows 11, you also need to tick the box below it as well. For me, I'm on Windows 10, so I'm going to untick that. At the very bottom of the application, we have the ISLC polling rate. This is pretty much how often it's going to check itself. If you're on a mid to higher end system, you can set this to 500. On a lower to mid range system, you can set this to 1000. Once you have that done, all we need to do from here is hit the start button and this will start the application for us. Now, I know we also have an option here to purge the standby list. This is not a mandatory button that you have to press, but what this will do is it will purge any standby memory, as you'll see right there. Again, this is not mandatory, but I like to just purge any standby memory before I start the application. Now keep in mind that once you start this for the first time, and you have all these boxes checked at the bottom, now every time you start your system and start Windows, it will automatically open the application, it will minimize it to your taskbar, and it will also start the application, just like that. But for your first time, just make sure that you hit the Start button to enable the application to start working. If you do not hit the start button, it will not set your current timer resolution and it will not start purging your RAM. After you start the ISLC application for the first time, you wanna go up to the top and verify that your current timer resolution says 0.5 milliseconds as what we set it for here below. If it does not say 0.5 and it says anything other than that, then there's a couple other things that we need to do. Now, the reason why we need this to say 0.5 exactly and not 0.49 or anything else is because that could actually cause latency issues. So now what I want to do is to show you what to do if your current timer resolution does not say 0.5. For this, I'm going to refer to a previous video that I've done to explain how to adjust this on your system. In the video I will be showing you, we're going to be opening up the command prompt. To open the command prompt, you need to go down to your search bar and you're going to type in CMD. At the very top, you will see the command prompt. You're going to right click and then run that as administrator. It is very important for this section that you run the command prompt in administrative mode and to verify you are in administrative mode, you will see Windows backslash system 32. If yours does not say this, then you need to close out of the command prompt and reopen again in administrative mode. Then point five, we're going to go over now how we can make sure that this is set up properly. So the first thing we need to do to correct this issue is to again bring up the command prompt and make sure you open it in administrative mode. Next, we're gonna type in three different commands here. Copy and paste will be down in the description so you don't have to type all of these in individually. We're also gonna be going over each of these commands so you understand what they're gonna be doing and one of these you may not wanna do if you are on a laptop. We'll get to that here in a second. So the first command that we're gonna use here is the bcd edit space forward slash set then we're going to type in use platform tick space yes and then you're going to hit enter so what this command does is it forces the clock to be backed by a platform source 
and no synthetic timers are allowed. That means that it is going to be backed by this ISLC program and set using the wanted timer resolution that we had put in here previously. The next command that we're going to enter is BCD edit space forward slash set disable dynamic tick space yes. Dynamic ticks are a feature that lets Windows stop the system timer when nothing is happening in order to conserve power. What this command does is it disables a power saving function that is really going to be used for PCs or desktops. If you have a laptop that is going to be plugged in all the time, then you can go ahead and use this command. If you are only using battery on your laptop, this may draw a little bit more power so you may not want to use this command if you're using a laptop not plugged into a constant power source. The last command that we're going to enter here is bcd edit space delete value use platform clock and then hit enter. Now if you so happen to get a error message here or something like that, it's perfectly okay you are all good to go and we are done. All right, so now that you have finished with the command prompt, you need to close out of that and reboot your system for everything to take effect. All of these commands will be down below in the copy and paste section in the description, as well as the commands if you wish to revert back to the way it was. All right, so that's gonna finish us up for today's video. Thanks everybody for joining us. If you have any comments or questions, Post them down below in the comments section and I'll get right back with you. If you found today's video useful, make sure to hit that subscribe, click on that little bell, and smash that thumbs up button. To all my flight simmer friends around the world, keep the blue side up and we will see you on the next one. Thanks for watching everybody.